So I'm Lloyd Elvin. I work for Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center in Seattle. I've been a DBA there for nine years, been a postgres DBA for the last 15 years. Um, a lot of what I specialize in uh, is tuning the servers, um, fixing uh, speed issues uh, with queries. Um, <coughs> Uh, just, you know, when I took over from my boss, uh, she had the servers conservatively tuned. I now have them aggressively tuned, and the queries react three times faster. Uh, so, you know, it depends on how you tune your Postgres SQL conf file. Uh, I also speed up queries. Uh, I work with that a lot um, in house uh, this last week. They had an overall function that was taking a half an hour. And they added some new MD5 hashes to it, went up to three and a half hours. I got that back down to a half an hour. And then I said, oh, well, I can take your big function inside of there that takes 10 minutes and fix that for you. And I took it down to six and a half seconds. Um, so there's uh, ways that you can speed stuff up. You just got to look at it. Uh, Postgres has so many different options that you can do. Unrelated to this talk. <laughs> so Dockers. Uh, we're, we've been looking at how to get, how to do a cloud implementation of Postgres that meets our needs um, to test it. And so I've been looking at Docker's, VMs, uh, uh, Linux containers, um, you, know, you know, across the board. Uh, been doing evaluation of all the different providers, Google, Microsoft Azure, Amazon, uh, Heroku. Uh, using pre-built dockers, using custom dockers, uh, all of that. So these, uh, this presentation came out of all that research. There are two official Docker images for Postgres uh, for Alpine Linux. Uh, the main one is built on Debian Jesse. The other one that you can get to is an Alpine Linux 3.5 version. Um, but it doesn't support LDAP in the 3.5 version, and that's one of my requirements, is we need to be able to hook it into our LDAP server, which is hooked into our AD server uh, for the main hatch, for authentication purposes, uh, for all the user accounts, because each uh, statistician has their own login access to the database uh, with their hatch account. And so it needs to be able to authenticate them. And what data they can see in the database is based upon who they're logged in as. So each user, you know, one user may be able to see this study and a different user will be able to see a different study and they can't cross see each other's study data. So we need to be able to have all that account support. So we needed LDAP. Now, there, the Alpine Edge version uh, does support LDAP. So if you want to get their latest stuff, you can, can uh, do that. Um, and what I'm going to do is talk about how to take their edge ones and build a bunch of extra extensions for it and build them as packages so that you can deploy them out to many images all at once. Let's see. And when I publish these slides up, there's going to be a bunch of uh, extra links, like there's three hyperlinks below this slide, because uh, I've got notes on a lot of these slides. Oh, wait a minute. Was there something there? Yeah. Uh, so APKA build is, uh, is what we're going to do, uh, so we can build up these extra packages. Okay, so Alpine Linux is based upon BusyBox, which is 1.1 megabytes. Alpine Linux is 3.98 megabytes. With Postgres, without PL Perl, it's 25 megabytes. If you want PL Perl in it, it's 50 megabytes. Uh, Postgres everything, which uh, includes a bunch of extra packages I compiled for it, is 222 megabytes. Where the Amazon Linux is 292 megabytes. So I'm, I'm below them in size. Um, the thing with Alpine Linux, because it's so slimmed down, there's not as much stuff on it, so it's more secure and less data transfer when you're moving stuff around. Which is, most people don't think about it, is when you shove it into a system, 
up on like Amazon, you're, you're not paying for that inbound data, you're only paying for the outbound data. But if you want to pull stuff back out on stuff, you know, or things, I look at things like that too. Um, and Postgres everything includes PG Semi 4 uh, for somatic versioning, PG TAP, uh, PLR, R, PL Perl, uh, Perl, Python, uh, which is Python 2.7, LDAP, SSH, TDS, FDW for connecting to um, Microsoft foreign data wrappers, free TDS, which is also needed to do that, uh, C store for doing column store ta uh, tables, uh, PLTCL, which uh, I don't need, uh, PGTCL also, which I don't need, and Postgres units um, uh, to get the extra math in there. So that's uh, what I do, what, where Postgres everything comes out when you do all those. And R, of course, takes up a lot of that space. But, you know, one of the things is R, putting R in side of Postgres, you can have it output graphs, uh, statistical graphs of your data without having to suck it out to a separate server and then process it there. Postgres itself can generate those graphs right inside and not have to do massive data transfers. Now, while I don't use R in, in our in-house systems, I am looking at using R in our cloud systems. Oh, and I also use the Microsoft foreign data wrappers because we do have Microsoft servers at the main center at Hutch, and we do pull some data from them. So I need to be able to talk, talk to those servers. Let's see. So downloading Alpine Linux. Uh, there are several different ways to get it. You can get a virtual machine of it, uh, where you can download an ISO image. Uh, and you can also get a Docker image of Alpine Linux. You can also get a Linux container version of it. Uh, I am showing here how to get the 64-bit versions. Uh, and you do the AMD64 if you're looking for the Linux container version. You can get a 32-bit version, and it's also available for the Raspberry Pi. In fact, I gave a presentation here, I think about 2012, on how to build Postgres for the Raspberry Pi, uh, but uh, on, on their uh, Raspberry distribution uh, back in the day, long, long time ago. So, on the original Raspberry Pi. Uh, but this, yeah, you can put the Alpine Linux on a, on a Raspberry Pi and be able to build, put Postgres on it, no problem. By the way, the Raspberry Pi is on uh, Postgres's build farm. So it's actually tested every day. Uh, they build it for it every day. Let's see. <coughs> oh, and the LXC creates, uh, you may need to sudo to do these ones. Uh, there's, those are part of my notes in, uh, in the file. Now at work I use the uh, VM. Uh, on my local desktop, on my Windows desktop, to build uh, the packages at home. I have a, um, a server at home, and I'm wiping on the name now, uh, where I actually create a Linux container uh, to, to use as my build environment because when I shut down the server and restart it up, all my files are still there in my Linux container. Um, well, I don't have to mount storage to it like you would with a Docker image. Uh, so I find it easy to, uh, to continue on where I left off without a problem using the Linux container. Okay, starting up your container, you can do L uh, LXC start, um, your name of your container, and then you log into it, your container, so you attach to it. Uh, and I already talked about that, so that's not a problem. So the first thing you need to do is upgrade uh, Alpine. So you can uh, edit this file here, which is your repositories file. And then I want to change from the 3.5 out to the Edge version. This will uh, allow me to get all the latest and greatest stuff. And I think it's once a quarter, Alpine takes the Edge version and makes it a new release. So whatever is in the Edge gets rolled out. 
all the time. Uh, and I wanted that edge version because the Postgres and the edge had the, um, ah, <coughs> LDAP, yeah, that's it, uh, so that I could do the authentication. Also, you want to add the community uh, one. Also, if you want the PLR in it. Because the community contains R and the R dev packages, which are not contained as part of the main Alpine distribution. So then you need to do the update, APK update, which will update the repository indexes, then do the APK upgrade, uh, an update cache, and then reboot your machine after that. Fairly simple at that point. Now we need to set up our build environment for building our packages. Uh, this is a great set of documentation right here, creating an Alpine package. So that after, uh, and basically all these instructions are in this page too. Uh, install the Alpine SDK, Software Development Kit. Add your user, because you've been logged in as the super root user, super user. Uh, we also need to add ourselves to the sudoers so we can uh, sudo in the commands. Add group. Uh, we, you need to add the user to the A build so that you can build the packages. Uh, we need to make our distribution directories, uh, our cache directories for our distribution so that when we download packages that we can uh, reuse them. We don't have to re-download them all the time because he, uh, when you build a package you might you, uh, use that same package for, for uh, sub-package might use that same sub package more than once, and instead of it having to download it every single time, it would just store them in the cache here and reuse them. Reboot your machine again, reattach to your container. <coughs> now we need to set up uh, Git, although you could use uh, GitHub also. Um, it's, uh, both are available. Uh, so, uh, SU to your new user account. Uh, get, uh, do the config for the git, set your username and email address, uh, change to your home directory, and then clone the A ports. Now this is all the packages for Alpine Linux. It's, it's uh, all the uh, build files. Uh, so with the A ports, this uh, downloaded, you can build every package for Linux for the Edge version. And what we're going to do is we're going to add our own. We can look at these packages, but we can also add our own packages in there too to be built, which is what we're going to do. So we're going to go into this directory and add our own new one. Um, the thing about uh, the Git is it's just going to create an imports directory where when I uh, was using the GitHub, it'd do a dash and a, and the version number uh, for where you're downloading from, which was more annoying to me so that's why I used the Git, so I just put in the A ports. Now I'm sure other people could handle it better, but uh, I'm a Postgres DBA, not a Unix person, <laughs> per se. I let the, the IT world handle a lot of that side of it. Okay, so you need to build a key because every build that you do is going to be signed. And the dash A here, uh, sets a private key in the abuild conf file, which uh, we'll, we need to know when we need to copy keys out. Um, dash i installs the public keys, and non-interactive mode, so it's not going to ask you any questions. It's just going to build it for you. Uh, the repository is signed, although you can tell APK to ignore the signatures. So if somebody has published their repository, uh, that you could, and they used a, uh, their own key that they built, but they didn't go out and have it signed, then you can say dash dash allow dash untrusted, and it will go and download the packages. If you don't do this, or have your key that you generated signed by a certificate signer, uh, it won't uh, download the packages for you. Uh, it only wants to deal with signed packages unless you specifically which, which you have to then have this key publicly signed, or you have to put the allow and trust it. So, 
Your key for your repository is located in your ETC AB page keys, uh, your email address dash, uh, a code that it sticks in .rsa.com. This key will be needed uh, to be copied to your new Alpine machine before you install your custom build packages unless you do the allow and trust it. Um, uh, because, I, I'm, because I'm not having my key publicly signed. That's why I need to do that. If you have your key publicly signed, then you don't need to copy this over. Um, but for testing purposes, you know, for uh, you know, evaluating this, we didn't want to go that route, so I just copied the pub key over. Uh, and actually, I did the all untrusted first, and then I started copying the pub key over. So your public private keys are located in these directories. <coughs> so APK files uh, are also called APACs, and that's why you download the APACs. Um, these are digitally assigned tar GZ files. Uh, so you can actually unzip uh, one of the uh, APK files that you download, and you see all the files inside of it. Um, the packages are, can be stored in one, one or more repositories, so in your repositories file that we edited earlier, we can list multiple repositories. Like I was talking about the Edge repository, and also you want, uh, I put in the Edge community repository so that I can get the R in there. Uh, for installing, so I can compile PLR. APKs, okay, yep, I already talked about that. Oh, you can also specify a repository on, on your line by doing a dash dash repository if you don't want to update the uh, repository file. Um, I just update the repository files myself. Okay, in your home directory, you'll have that A-port, so we downloaded from Git. Or an A-port dash revision code from GitHub. Uh, you want to change directory into that. Any package created by the Alpine Linux is under main. Otherwise, there's another one that's called community, which will have all the community packages in it. Uh, we're going to go into the main package. Uh, and you'll find Postgres in there. Postgres for the Edge one is the one I like. I like their compile of that. I don't like their compile for the 3.5. As I said, the 3.5 doesn't have the LDAP in it. So the way they compiled the Postgres for the Edge, I looked at that and I said, okay, that one's okay. I'm fine with the Postgres. I just want extra packages. Um, okay. And you can push these packages back out to... Um, to Alpine Linux, uh, if you want, uh, there's a way to contribute to it. Uh, you can read their documentation on it here, and you can submit a uh, git patch, or you can submit a pull request on GitHub, and they will uh, bring those packages in, and they'll add them to the community side, and if they want to start maintaining them, or, they, or, they're be, or you're maintaining them uh, really well, then they'll put them as part of the main build. So that's your one. Uh, so that's your way of getting it back in, so that it's part of the main packages versus uh, having to keep your own repository going. So I'm going to use an example of how to do pgtap in here. Uh, pgtap is a system for unit testing Postgres. Um, so you can uh, let's say you've got advanced functions in Postgres. You can use pgtap to put certain data in your database, execute that function, and make sure the result is exactly what you're expecting. Or if you're refactoring stuff, you can test that. Um, so I use P uh, VGTAP for unit doing a variety of unit testing. Now, so what you need to do is you need to edit your a APK build file. And we need to put our package name in there, which is going to be called pgtap. We want our package version. Uh, this is the version of pgtap. We can also do a package release. So if we build, if we decide we need to change our, how we build it, we want to increase our release version, even though the pgtap uh, tap version isn't changing. So if we need to build this package more than once, then we want to increment uh, the package release version number. 
and then you reset that back down to zero every time you go to a new PG tap version. You can put a description in here, a URL to the website that this comes from. Uh, you can put the license in here, and there's a whole list of licenses uh, that, uh, on the Alpine site uh, that you can put in here. And this is actually a comma separated list of licenses. So when I was building these, I went to the source website and looked at what license the source was using to put in the correct license name into here. And I found uh, one of the sites had more than one license on it. So I went in here and put them comma separated in here for all, each different license that it supported. For the people who are very interested in having all of one type of license. Uh, I can say what uh, my dependencies in here, and you, you can do an equal sign and put it out to a very specific revision number, or you can say greater than a specific number. You can say who the package users and groups are, and what the make dependencies are. Um, and for some of my stuff, I use the su exec uh, command. So I uh, put that into my make dependencies also. And it will automatically package up the docs as a separate package. Uh, you just say sub packages, uh, package name dash doc, and it will take the documentation and all st stick it in a separate package. So when you install an Alpine Linux package, it has no documentation in it whatsoever. That's part of how they make it a, a small distribution is because you don't have any docs loaded. You have to explicitly load the docs if you want the docs. Um, source, this is where to download the actual uh, source file from. And we're going to set up our, our build directory, which is our source directory, package name, and package version. Source directory is uh, is one that comes out of the build system automatically. It's a build variable, so we're not setting that variable. And, yeah. Okay, then we come prepare. So uh, this is preparation before we do the building. We uh, make our PG data local directory. We uh, Set the permissions on our PG data local directory because for PG tap you need Postgres installed to compile it against. Uh, we change into our, uh, our uh, change the ownerships. Uh, we initialize our database and we start up our Postgres server. So now we're going to be now that we've started up Postgres, now we can compile PG tap against our Postgres. <coughs> and because we set the repository to Edge, that's going to download the Edge version of the Postgres, which has the LDAP support in it. Okay, so now we have our build. So we can put out a message to the screen saying we're now building PG tap. I need to load a couple of uh, Perl modules in for it. <coughs> and then we need to sudo, exec, postgres, make, and the build directory. Uh, and the reason is, uh, why we're doing the sudo exec is because you're running the, your, the build scripts are running as your user. The sudo takes you up to the root user, which you can't build the PG tap with, you need to build the PG tap as user Postgres. So we need to, so once we go up to root, we use the pseudo exec to change the user Postgres to then build the PG tap. Okay, package. Uh, so we tell it to make the PG tap. And we set our destination directory, install. And this is actually, uh, this install in here is uh, the package is going to grab all those installation files and create two packages out of them. It's going to create the main package and it's going to create the documentation package. Now we can create extra stuff uh, to, uh, to do other sub packages out of it if we need to split it up more. Uh, but automatically it's going to take your install 
and out of this uh, destination package directory, which and and divide the files up into your documentation and your main install. Okay, checksums. So, one of the things you need to do is these APK build files need to have checksums in them so that it knows it's downloading the correct file and that it got a good download of it. Um, so there's a checksum at the bottom that we need to put in and it will do that for us. Uh, two, two, two. And I thought I had it in here. Well, there's an APK build dash something, and I can't remember it offhand, that will actually go and run it and, and download the, um, the, the, the source file and build the checksum for you automatically. It might be the dash C command. And that will and it will actually update the APK build file for you with the checksum, uh, or multiple checksums if you're downloading multiple source files. So it'll do all that for you. You don't have to think about that, uh, you know, manually. Um, you can do the dash R if you need to uh, check your uh, packages for architecture issue uh, to recursively build. Uh, you can also check for architecture issues with the dash RK command. Um, if AK build stops in the process because you've got a problem in the build file, it leaves a build directory for you underneath your package directory. Um, so you have your a, a ports directory, you have your package name directory underneath there where you've got your APK build file. And then underneath that is going to be a build directory, there's going to be source directories, there's going to be the final package directory. Well, it leaves that whole structure behind if it stops mid-process. And then when you restart, it's going to delete all those files and then build new directories then. And because it leaves the stuff behind, you can go in there and see where it stopped at, uh, what did it build, what did it not build, and, and gives you hints, you know, basically, about where your problem was in your code. Also, uh, there was that message command, so you can spit out messages along the way, so you know, help you know also where stuff is breaking. Okay. Okay. So once you do that, then you can, you can build all those scripts for all your different extensions, which is what I did. Um, So in my Docker file, then, I uh, created a Postgres, uh, for Postgres, I, I had uh, my Docker file, I had my Postgres, the build directory, and I put my pub file in there for my customer repository, so I had my key because I didn't have it publicly assigned, because I'm just, it's just for an in-house repository. I put my Postgres auto.com file in there, um, and my bghba comp, and my recovery.com. Um, or uh, if I'm uh, starting up as a uh, primary server, I a lot of times just put a recovery.done in there. Uh, and the reason why I put a recovery.done is it, uh, Postgres will <coughs> ignore recovery.done. In fact, when you promote a secondary server, Postgres automatically renames recovery.conf to recovery.done if you use Postgres's promote command. And the reason is, is Postgres will recopy the recovery.done file if you use the PG based backup. Yes, to copy, to stream it from one server to another to create a new secondary server, it's going to copy that recovery.done file for you. So I like putting in recovery.done or recovery.conf depending on what I'm working on. Your Docker file um, from Alpine Edge because I want that LDAP support. Uh, of course, remember every quarter that's going to roll out to a new version. Uh, label, who's the maintainer if you want to stick that in. 
Uh, I set the environment language to the UTF-8 because I want my, uh, my databases automatically to be a UTF-8. I'm going to deal with Postgres 9.6, so I set the major version number in here. I, I copy in my public key uh, and store that into the etc apk keys uh, directory. Run the apk update, and now I need to start adding my packages. So I can add Postgres, uh, PL Perl, PL Python 2. Uh, uh, also, they build PL Python 3 if you want it also. Uh, instead, I should say, instead of uh, 2. Uh, add my contrips. I want the SU exact and open RC. Then we can update our cache to the, uh, with the uh, community. I want so we can install, install R on there. Uh, so then at this point, I go ahead and install PGTAP, which we just created. Uh, I created the Postgres unit one. Uh, I created a PLR one, the PG semi four, column store foreign data wrapper, the uh, TDS foreign data wrapper, which is for Microsoft SQL Server. Uh, update the cache repository. And this is one where I specified out the repository line. So that went to our local repository. Now, if we had updated in up in here, the uh, if we copy over a new repository file that gave our repository location in there, we wouldn't have to do that. But because I copied the key over, we didn't have to tell it to uh, to uh, to do the untrusted. And we need to expose our port. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to talk to Postgres. And we can do our Docker build, create our Postgres. Now, what this does is I'm building it once, but making two copies of it, because uh, I have two dash T lines in here. So one is going to build it as Postgres 962, and this one is going to build it as Postgres latest, so that you can get both of them on your system as, as either way. Um, so yeah, you can create, uh, put in multiple dash keys in there. But it only does one build and then just copies it. Now you can run your Docker image interactively, so you can uh, test stuff out. You know, sudo docker run ip-rm and a specific Postgres and uh, get into the sh shell in it. And then you can actually go in and start up Postgres, play with it, do all sorts of testing of it yourself. And of course, I get excited and I run really fast. <laughs> That's the way I get. Um, I have a huge amount of links uh, on the last pages of these slides uh, as reference documents. Uh, and then I also talked about uh, doing NSF mounts also. Uh, I gave some extra instructions for that. That's my presentation. Having run through it extremely fast, we are way ahead of time. <laughs> but uh, I get excited. And so I, I'm bad at that. <laughs> I'm also used to my Postgres users group interrupting me all the way through asking questions. <laughs> So, so that, that normally uh, spreads out my time, so I'm not going so fast. Any questions? Where are you from? Seattle. Uh, I'm born and raised in Seattle. Uh, I now live out in Monroe. I work for Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center. I've worked there for nine years. I've been a Postgres DBA for the last 15 years. I picked, uh, needed to do a job for a client. I was running a a small consulting ISP company in Seattle at the time, and I needed to do a database job, uh, having already worked with databases, but do a big uh, database-driven website. And so I researched what was the best database out there at the time, and picked Postgres, and have stayed with it ever since. Yeah? What was the ISP that you were working with? Uh, it was my own ISP, uh, Turner Communications. So it was a small one. We were uh, we're up on the 32nd floor of the Weston building. Um, 
So I had our servers in there. And uh, I dealt with uh, people like Sunset Bowl, Leilani Lanes. They were some of my customers in Seattle. Um, in Did fact. Mr. Bull there, I feel like we have a connection now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But before the presentation, you mentioned you were evaluating Dockerizing Postgres and moving it to cloud providers. Mm -hmm. But are you thinking like passing through the storage to persistent volumes, things like that? Uh, talk, talk about what you're evaluating. OK, so part of what I'm evaluating is we want to have a local replica of the data. So Amazon Aurora Postgres only supports read replicas right now all in the beta, but they're talking about having external read replicas in the final production, but which is not released yet. Um, so the beta one won't work for me because I want that copy local so that should Amazon go down, we still have all of our data in-house. Um, because we have requirements for the government to have our, our access to our data, um, you know, quickly and stuff. So uh, we need to be able to have backups in-house. You know, we can make backups in the cloud, but they don't count for us for under our regulations. We have to be able to have access to those backups immediately. So therefore, we also need them in-house, in addition to the cloud backups. And so that's why we're looking at the local read replica, also so our statisticians can run queries off the lo local read replica, so we're not having to pay the inbound data from Amazon to us. We only pay for it once as it streams across the read replica, and then different statisticians can all hook up to that and talk to it all day long without us uh, costing us more money. So we're looking at money savings in the long run also. Uh, it's in their documentation that it is not available in the beta, but they are, are planning for it in the final release. So when you say beta, they went general availability on that. It's still beta. It's still beta. Yeah. It's still listed as beta. Yeah. Um, I do like the Amazon Aurora. They, now, but I do have issues with it. So Amazon, if you look at Redshift, Redshift, they forked Postgres, and uh, they, turned it in, they turned it 90 degrees and made a column store system out of it. So it's great for analytics, but it's stuck at Postgres 8.0.2 because they've never updated it. Well, with Amazon Aurora, they forked Postgres again. So it's at 9.6.1. And what I'm afraid of is it's not going to get updated, which is fine for the next two or three years, but after that, you may want to switch away from the product if they don't update it again. Now, the things that they did with it to make it faster performance, because they, they're getting twice the speed out of it, is they took different subsystems out of the Postgres, like the auto vacuum, and they put it on a different server. So they split the processes out to different servers to do all the maintenance work so that your queries could be twice as fast. Uh, so they did a really good concept, and, and they did a bunch of other stuff behind the scenes to deal with uh, replication and stuff like that. Uh, so they're getting twice the performance. It's a really good idea, but I'm scared of it because I'm afraid it's going to go the same way as Amazon Redshift, where it's just going to be stuck at a specific version. Um, so that, that's my issues with that, but it's, it's very, it's close to the top on, on my, my review list. Um, uh, compared to uh, some of the other ones. So, um, my custom dockers I like the best, of course, because I can get in all the extra extensions, but for some sites that we, uh, for some databases we host, we don't need those extra extensions, so something like Amazon Aurora would be fine for it. Looked like you were going to have a question. Uh, uh, is that Mm -hmm. the HIPAA and all of that. Mm -hmm. um, what was your driving force to, to, to go to Amazon and even ask them to, to do this for you? Okay, so uh, we've got a new head of IT in the, in the main hutch. Okay. Not in our group, in the main hutch. And of course he came from Microsoft. And he's a big cloud pusher. 
So we've got, uh, from top down of the hutch, people going, okay, we want to get stuff out in the cloud. Let's try and do it. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a, a smaller project and push it out. We're not going to take all of our current stuff and push it out. We're just going to take a smaller project, push it out, and test it and evaluate it and see whether it works. Now we are running a virtual private connection out to Amazon. We've got that all set up. Amazon's, uh, well, because we're a nonprofit, they're giving us special rates on stuff so we can do this. Um, but we'll see if it works or doesn't work for us. And the, and the main guy, he, he admits, not everything will work good this way. And some stuff you do need to keep in house. But it's, we're gonna try it, see if it works, see what the cost is, versus the cost of doing it in-house. Um, yeah. Or the, cost of, or the cost of keeping everything in sync between two databases. Yep. Yeah. You've got development servers that you're going to have to keep in sync. You've got data coming out a lot, too. So if you yep. refresh, you might as well push all this stuff to the cloud, too. Now everybody's in there. All your crazy R stuff is going to be, all of you is going to be in the cloud. Yep. And then you just keep your local stuff the regular way. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's going to be interesting to see because we do uh, SAS connections to these data. You know, the statisticians are using SAS a lot. Uh, they're using R, um, you know, a variety of different stuff to hook in and, and process data. So, um, and we prefer them not to be talking out to the cloud. That's where we want to get them talking to the local read replica because they're not actually writing the data. They're just sucking it out and doing analytics on it. So. Uh, although we have been uh, building a new system uh, where they will take those final, da final data sets out of SAS, instead of write them to a file on the file system, we're going to have them push them back in, uh, back into a new database. Uh, so we're trying to get our statisticians away from the file system. They love the file system as, as their uh, uh, database storage. <laughs> and uh, we're trying to get them away from that with current projects we're working on. In what? Uh, in 10? Um, oh, there's new stuff coming all the time. I'm uh, very interested in the, um, and, it, and it's, it came out in the 9.6 and, and a little bit earlier if you, if you looked at this stuff, which is the uh, multi-threading of queries. You know, that that's gets me excited because Postgres historically has always been single-threaded. You know, one query can only run on one core and that's it. And now with the, uh, you know, initially it came out that you could write C functions and, that, and each C function could spawn other threads. And, you know, that was the first thing coming out. And then they came out to where if you do just a, ta uh, you read an entire table in, it could do that multi-threaded. And they're just keeping and building on that, and that's going to be one of the big things that's uh, coming out in, in the next years, is we're going to get so much more of that multi-threading capability in there, uh, which will make our queries respond much faster. I'm hoping that's going to save me from the materialized view problem I was talking about earlier. You know, with steps of degree of parallelism and all that stuff. Have you explore, explored at all the change data capture? From your master, or just replicate that way back to your your on-prems. Um, change? No, I haven't looked into that side of stuff. Um, I just use the standard streaming replication um, to do it. Well, that's always done what I needed. So, yeah. Um, of course, uh, also if you. Mark Wong gave a presentation yesterday on uh, the new features for Postgres 10. Okay, good. Yeah, that's one I specifically asked him to do here because that's not the one he submitted. He was uh, submitted the PG Logic one, and I specifically asked him to write one on Postgres 10 uh, for, uh, for us yesterday. Um, I mentioned beforehand, uh, PGCon is coming up in Ottawa this month. It is the biggest Postgres conference in the world. Uh, all the uh, so there's two days of tutorials, two days of conference. Uh, there's a day of on-conference afterwards on Saturday, but the Wednesday, the last day of the tutorials, is also the developers' unconference, uh, where all the Postgres developers get together from around the world and discuss 
what's going to happen with Postgres for the next year, what are they going to be working on, and, and hash things back and forth, saying, no, we don't like this, we do like this, you know, and, and design how it's going to go. If those meetings are open to the public, you're welcome to attend them and get your influence on what happens with Postgres for the next year uh, or years down the road. What's the date of that? Um, well, I'm heading up there the 19th because I'm going up early, but that's Friday the 19th. So, okay. Yeah. So, and then I'm coming back the 28th. So, my work, because I'm taking three days of vacation up there. Because every time I go up there, I take two or three days of vacation ahead of the conference that I pay for personally, and work sends me up for the conference. <laughs> so. Yeah, so that's, that's a, a great conference to go to. Um, the US ones, the thing is with the US conferences, the international people don't get into them. Uh, as I was saying before, people from Russia, Japan, Germany, oh, there was many people, from, there's several people from Germany this last year up there, uh, Brazil, Italy, uh, uh, United Kingdom, they all come to PGCon and I don't see them showing up at the US conferences that I've been to. They only go to the, to the one up in Ottawa because it's easier to get for them to get into Canada than it is for them to get into the United States. And so you get all those international people there. Um, Skype, before they became part of Microsoft, uh, well, in fact, they still use Postgres for Skype. Uh, but they, they sent a bunch of their developers from Lithuania to uh, PGCon when I was there in 2008. And I got, I, was interacting with them uh, in, the, in the evenings. So there's social events every single night that you can attend. Uh, some are paid, some you just go hang out with the, with the people. And you know, last May I was hanging out with the core team of Postgres and that's when they made the decision to go Postgres 10 you know, as the new number. Uh, I was in on those, those things. And that's the thing, you can be there and learn about this stuff really early on if you want to. Um, but yeah, Skype uh, uses Postgres and does a lot of replication between servers and stuff too. Oh, uh, I met the uh, NTT from Japan, which is the Nippon Telephone and Telegraph. Uh, they're a big contributor to Postgres foreign data wrappers. And they had uh, their developer uh, from it there. And they had um, uh, other people there and they were working on a Postgres conference over there in uh, Tokyo and was trying to get people to come over and speak at it. Um, so there was, you know, uh, there was a gal from Russia who I learned about uh, indexes from. Um, and actually there was uh, two speakers on indexes. There were one guy from Germany and this gal from Russia. And I talked to some of these people earlier before, but we've been having a problem with index bloat where we reload study data into our database. Because it comes in from um, data facts, which uh, uh, captures uh, faxes, turns them into, uh, it goes through OCR translation, because we're getting data from all over the world, and shoves it into flat tables, which we then load up into our database for the analytics side of it. Well, that data gets reloaded all the time. But we don't want to truncate the table, because that goes across all studies. We just want to drop a single study and reload the data. Most of the records are exactly the same, so you're going to have the same key identifiers. The natural keys are going to be the same. So what happens is you do this delete star, or delete where the study name, it deletes all those records, and internally, each record is called a tuple in Postgres, so it flags the tuple in the table as deleted, but it doesn't do anything with the index. So when you go and do your insert, it has a new record that's the exact same key, but it doesn't have room on the index page. So what it does is it splits that index page into two pages and does its new entries. And it's not until you do a select on the table using that study that then it went and flagged the old index entries or tuples as deleted. But still you've doubled your index size. Now, if you, uh, let's say you do your delete and then you do a vacuum and then you do an insert, you're still gonna have the same problem because the vacuum doesn't vacuum the index. The way to do it is to build a new index concurrently and then swap out the indexes inside of a transaction. 
which is how we had done stuff in code, but you know, that's still building a whole new index. So what I found out behind the scenes is the select on the, uh, after you do the delete using the where clause, do a select on the table using the exact same where clause, which is not going to return any rows of data, but it has to scan the index, and as it's scanning the index, it's flagging those entries as deleted, so that then when you do the insane, when you do the insert, it'll reuse those deleted tuples, it'll write over them, therefore not doubling your index size. So if you're going to do these big massive deletes and massive reloads, then you need to do delete, select, and then insert uh, to, so that you don't cause your index bloat. And the index bloat was a big concern for us because it was slowing down our query use of the data afterwards. We were having performance issues from it. And so that's why we had to fix the problem and why we were so interested in it. In fact, I was giving presentations about index bloat. Uh, and stuff on it, uh, what the problems were and all that sort of stuff at the time. So, uh, so I host the Seattle Postgres Users Group the first Tuesday of every month at 1100 East Lake, which is in the South Lake Union area, it's on the Fred Hutchinson campus. Uh, July is our annual barbecue, uh, so you're welcome to go up on our fifth floor, we have a gas bar outdoor gas barbecue, and uh, we do that. Uh, but if you come to our general meetings, we uh, have pizza and water. Uh, this next month's meeting, I'm going to talk about those functions that I refactored that went from 10 minutes down to six and a half seconds. Uh, by, uh, you know, and stuff. This is during the day? Evening, 7 p.m. Oh, good. All right. So, yes, after work for me. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, 7 p.m., 1100 East Lake, first Tuesday of every month, except for July which we're having to go second Tuesday because it interfered with 4th of July. So, yeah. Um, let's see, 1023, I guess we're good, unless people got more questions. Okay, well then, great.